This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 894, recorded on April 26, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 7 degrees Celsius, and it's kind of gray skies, all clouds. 14C and cloudy here in New York City. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is uh, 53 Fahrenheit, 12 Celsius with fog and mist. Um, the kind of day when tennis practice is canceled. <laughs> That's why you're here, yes, right? So here I am. <laughs> okay. Do you have tennis on Fridays also? Oh, uh, we have tennis all the time. It's uh, oh yeah. Is your daughter going to be a star? Uh, well, I, we're we're hoping you know college level, you know that kind of thing. And she's all right. I look she forward is, to seeing you in the stands good. at the U.S. Open one yes, day. Yes, right. And hey, we'll, look, it's Alan Dove. <laughs> also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi. It is also cloudy in 63 Fahrenheit, 17 Celsius here. And uh, also, I suppose, I don't know if you play tennis in that or not. <laughs> as, as long as it's not raining, you could probably. Okay. So, Alan, will you wear a hat and sunglasses so no one will recognize you in the stand? Uh, well, probably just so I won't get too much sun in my eyes because usually outdoor tennis matches are like that. All right. Tennis parents. Yes. I guess it could be worse, right? Well, um, if she does the high school team again next year, she'll be driving by then, and I won't have to deal with this. No. Oh. That'll be her problem. Very good. How far is the high school? How many miles? Oh, it's it's right. She can actually uh, bike it. Yeah. But biking it with her 40 pounds of – they still use paper textbooks, you know. So it's yeah. like all the textbooks plus the Chromebook, which all the kids are issued now, um, plus her – like 30 pound tennis bag, it's a little much on a bike. <laughs> but this summer you still have to take her, right? This summer in well, she'll probably get her license um, around midsummer is the target. The, the driving lessons have actually been delayed because she's at tennis all the time, so we can't schedule them after school on the weekdays when she yeah. Okay. <laughs> Complications. Yes. All right, for your virology knowledge learning today, we have a snippet which uh, has been requested by a number of listeners. And so uh, to guide our discussion, I have a document posted by WHO, World Health Organization, on April 23rd, three days ago. It's called Multi-Country Acute Severe Hepatitis of Unknown Origin in Children, I thought Kathy would enjoy this because they're trying to implicate adenovirus, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, uh, acute hepatitis of unknown etiology, a number of countries, I think first the UK and Northern Ireland uh, reported it on April 15th, and then um, there have been other countries as well. And what they say at the on onset, which is very important, it's not known if there has been an increase in hepatitis or an increase in awareness of hepatitis because we're looking more. And they say adeno is a possible agent, but we need to do more work for that. So we and, have, I, and I think the reason they zoomed in on adeno is because obviously a kid shows up with hepatitis, you test them for all the hepatitis alphabet and they come up negative and they don't have COVID-19 and what do they have? And so they do these screens and they find a lot of these kids have adenovirus infections, um, yeah. or some number of them have adenovirus some infections. Some number, yeah. Yes, although I would say it, we should point out, you said um, that they're SARS-CoV-2 negative. Um, in fact, some fraction of them were SARS-CoV-2 yeah. positive. Yes, yes, actually some of them were positive. But it's not like, oh, they're all showing up with SARS-CoV-2 right. and they have hepatitis, so we can't say that's causing it. Uh, and I guess a larger number of them have shown up with adeno, mm -hmm. which was there 41. one particular? 41. Yep. 41, yes. Right, which is an unusual one in a lot of ways. Okay. Let's, we'll hear from you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh, 
uh, 169 cases in 11 countries. Uh, so United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, Spain, Israel, U.S., Denmark, Ireland, Netherlands, Italy, Norway, France, Romania, and Belgium. So most of them are in the U.K., followed by U.K. and Northern Ireland. And these are mostly young kids, right? Yeah, one month to 16 years of age. But there's my understanding is that they're skewed toward the one to five age group. Okay. 17 children have required liver transplantation and one death. That's a serious issue there. Yeah. Wow. Serious hepatitis. So the clinical syndrome is acute hepatitis, which is an inflammation of the liver, and um, these, which you can measure in part by having elevated liver enzymes in the blood. Normally, they should stay in the liver where they do their jobs, but when the liver gets damaged, they get out into the blood. So you can measure them. And some of these cases have GI symptoms as well, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting. And the liver, right, liver enzymes are aspartate transaminase or alanine amino transaminase. You can go look up your biochemistry text and figure out what they're doing in the liver. Uh, the common hepatitis alphabet, as Alan mentioned, hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E, not found in any of these. And travel doesn't seem to be a factor either. Okay, now to adenovirus is found in 74 of those 169 cases. Um, and 18 are type 41, as, as Kathy says. SARS-CoV-2 in 20 cases, and 19 of them had a co SARS-CoV-2 adenovirus co-infection. So, Kathy, what's unusual about 41? Well, first of all, it's one of the two that has a GI tropism. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's 40 and 41. And so for a long time, they were very hard to study because they couldn't be propagated in cell culture until people, or they could only be done in, in 293 cells. So people, I guess, I, I can't remember when they figured that out, but I remember them being mm. called the fastidious adenoviruses <laughs> because you couldn't, you couldn't grow them. I like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so they mostly are known for causing diarrhea. Um, in sero surveys in Manchester, England, they represent 11% um, of the adenoviruses that are found, um, ad2, ad3, ad1 being higher than ad41. Um, so uh, there's that. In diarrhea pediatric patients in Southeast Asia, their ad40 and 41 are the most prevalent serotypes. Mm. So the other thing that's interesting about them is that they have a pretty um, different structure. I mean, it's still basically an adenovirus structure, but they have the AD41, they have two fibers. And there's only certain adenoviruses that have two fibers and ha how they're arranged differs depending on which of those different adenoviruses there are. But in this case, um, the short fiber comes out of one vertex and a long fiber will come out of a different vertex. And then for some adenoviruses that have two genes for mm -hmm. fiber, they both come out of the same one. And then there's a snake one where a short one comes out of <laughs> one vertex and uh, um, three other ones will come out of another vertex. So that's all different. But but also there's some nice structural work. Um, Nicholas Arnberg from Umeo and some other people are, are on a paper from I think it was from 2021, uh, where they did a cryo-EM structure. They weren't able to resolve the fibers because they flop all around. But the basic capsid structure um, it has some differences from the other adenoviruses. And then mm. they looked at it, because it has to go through the stomach, they looked at uh, how its structure is, it low pH versus a, a more neutral pH, and it's not that different. So uh, it's not that I, different at low and neutral pH, or it's not that different from, each, from other adenoviruses. From from at low and neutral pH, okay. it, it uh -huh. is still somewhat different from the other adenoviruses. And, and protein nine is different, and protein five is different, and yeah. Some do the other adenos survive through the stomach? Uh, yeah, 
Uh, they must. I mean, there's the uh, ad four and ad seven vaccines that are given in those. Mm. Well, they're they're given in the enteric coated capsules for vaccines. So maybe maybe not. Mm. Actually, I don't I don't really know. Maybe I don't know, Vincent, if you have an idea, but um, but know. I. Uh, but I wrote to a pediatrician who said, I bet patients with many versions of adenovirus infection have some mild hepta- hepatic inflammation that we never know about because we just never check. Yeah. Um, so he didn't sound surprised that maybe an adenovirus could be involved. And then um, my former postdoc and a good friend, Adriana Cayon, who does a lot of things with a lot of different adenovirus serotypes and things said uh, her phone's been ringing off the hook and she's been invited to give a a late breaking talk at the clinical virology meeting coming up and uh, there's just nothing there Mm. there's no evidence for causal relationship so this is so 41 is a an odd adenovirus i mean not just an odd number but it's it's (laughs) unusual in in a number of ways but it hasn't been linked to anything like this in the past and it's not clear that it's really linked to this either. Right. I mean, it you know, it definitely causes diarrhea and that's different from the other <laughs> adenoviruses. Um, and, you know, as as my pediatrician colleague said, you know, there, there could be hepatic inflammation. We just never check. Right. Mm. And, and my understanding is that every year a certain number of kids do turn up with acute hepatitis of unknown origin and nobody figures out what caused it. And some of those end up being serious and this has just been going on forever, which this, I gather these numbers are higher than expected, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it makes you wonder whether it's just a ascertainment bias, you know, suddenly now looking and here's what we see. Yeah. That, that was what I was going to ask. And I don't, I don't know if you know about this, Kathy, but they say, nevertheless, due to enhanced laboratory testing for adenovirus, this could represent the identification of rare outcomes or or something that had not been seen previously. So is there now, what's going on with this enhanced laboratory (laughs) testing for adenovirus? Is there a new test that has been developed that... I don't know. Yeah, I, that's news to me. I presume these are PCR assays that they're doing, right? You would think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't so I think there's stuff. a general increased awareness of viruses now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And and I think um, there's certainly a drastically increased capacity to do PCR on viruses. True. So it may be that a lot of major health centers have gone to testing for more viruses than they used to. Because they can yeah, in this document, they say that the UK has has seen an increase in adeno in the community in fecal samples in particular. So, I don't know, maybe they're doing a lot of fecal testing for other things. They, yes, they, that's a popular thing to do now for yeah. SARS-CoV-2, and, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah yep. no, that makes sense. I mean, even, even our health center here, I know, has bought something that allows them to do some molecular testing on student samples. So I guess now they could repurpose it for any sort of yeah. PCR. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we also have um, different viral ecology this year than we have had in years past because we've been suppressing the normal cycles. I think we, I, I was just reading recently that flu is on the, on the rise now in the U S in many parts of the U S including the Northeast. Um, and this is the time of year when normally flu is down because we come mm. off the winter when we flu would be high. But flu was low during the winter because a lot of the COVID-19 precautions were still in place and it's been down for the past two years. So mm. there may be other stuff going on with viral dynamics with adenoviruses. Yeah. But I think that there's something important to be said about that because I think sometimes people will say, oh my goodness, our COVID precautions have made flu worse. No. <laughs> and right. that's not the case. Very. It's that we have delayed the flu that we would have seen yes. previously. Um, because I've I've seen some reporting on this that, oh my gosh, our COVID precautions have suddenly allowed these children to have this terrible thing happen to them right. with adenovirus. And that's not... The no, case. <laughs> right. No, and, the, and that feeds into the whole narrative of oh, we ought to naturally get infected in order to strengthen our. No, that's not. We're just delaying some stuff yeah. that would have happened in the winter time. Just two weeks ago, I gave my uh, second. Uh, we give two lectures on influenza, and I showed the curve for the United States 
for this year versus last year, you know, for flu, it was basically flat. And for Mm -hmm. this year, there was a peak at the normal time. And then, like you said, Alan, kind of a trend going up um, as, you know, dates not yet Mm -hmm. (laughs) reported. But um, that that bump uh, mid-season is as as high as it's been in a couple of the years. I pointed that out to the students. So it was not particularly low this year for influenza. Um, Certainly not like last year. Right. Yeah, it is going up again. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And we have, we do have, um, I mean, very minimal protection from the vaccine this year, right? The data on that. Work. Yeah, the H3N2, which is the very disappointing, doesn't match. Yeah, we did that on TWIV some time ago. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's an unusual uptick, and it's as the peak is as big as the previous peak. So right. Curious, because when I did my flu lecture, <laughs> uh, Kathy, it wasn't yet up again. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> yep. Depends all in the you, timing. Um, so they they do say that, as Kathy said, you know, this adenoserotype doesn't fit the the clinical picture because it's not been previously linked to it. Although they say, you know, if it's a novel property, we have to know this. But they do say hypotheses related to side effects from the COVID vaccines are not supported, as the vast majority of the kids did not get vaccinated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So don't blame the vaccine, folks. No, kids, especially kids under five, are not vaccinated, and so, and a lot of the ones under twelve are not vaccinated. So what do we have to do? Keep investigating any new cases that come up. There'll probably sure. be some more. They say well, you should test blood, uh, serum, urine, stool, respiratory samples, and if you have a liver biopsy, test it. But don't do it just for no right <laughs> for this. No restriction on travel or trade with any country. So they have a working case because definition. Because trade and travel restrictions are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they didn't say that. No, right. Not exactly. But they have done it before, right? <sighs> they have a working case definition, which is important for surveillance. Uh, it is um, so... Confirmed they don't have one, but probable is a person presenting with acute hepatitis, non-A through E, with serum transaminase over a certain level, who is 16 years and younger since October 1st. That's very interesting. And then an epidemiologically linked case definition, a person presenting with acute non-A through E hepatitis who's been in contact with a probable case. Which is an important point because I haven't seen any epidemiology on this. Just yeah. there yeah. are these acute hepatitis. Well, do their brothers and sisters show up a week later with hepatitis? Does anybody in the neighborhood show up? So that's definitely something to look at. Hmm. Yeah, and it would also be you know interesting to see, well, did the brothers and sisters have the adenovirus or SARS-CoV-2 right. or right. any of these other things as well? Huh. All right, so we'll see. See what happens. I'm sure we'll get more information, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear if it's adenovirus or not. It's possible, but we you cannot conclude that. Several people have written and said, "How how does adenovirus cause this?" (laughs) (laughs) We don't know yet. Right. There seems to be an association, but then you know, it's sometimes could be pretty high, you know, the yeah. highest cases, highest numbers of cases in the first place were in the UK and yep. and Ireland. And as I told you, the seroprevalence for adenoviruses is 11% for ad 41 ordinarily. So. Yeah. Right. And, and it's not, it's certainly not a perfect link because 74 of these tested positive out of 169, which is. Yeah. Yeah, and that's 74 tested positive for any adenovirus. Yes. It was 18 that had That had the specific, yes. Very good point. Right. And a kid testing positive for an adenovirus is a pretty routine thing. Right. Okay, folks, there you go. And now on to other things. So I was at a meeting last week and someone said, someone who knows about antivirals said, the best antivirals are yet to come for SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> He said, they're going to change everything. Okay. (laughs) So this caught my eye, this paper, as a consequence. It's a Nature article. 
a Tempris 2 inhibitor acts as a pan SARS-CoV-2 prophylactic and therapeutic. And it has got two co-first first authors, Tirosh Shapira and I. Abre Montreal, and three corresponding authors, Richard Leduc, Hector Aguilar, and Francois Jean. And they are from University of British Columbia, Cornell University in Ithaca, University of Sherbrooke. So we have talked about Tempress 2, T-M-P-R-S-S-2, as uh, a cell surface protease that is uh, essential for SARS-CoV-2 fusing at the cell surface. Now, remember that in lung cells, the uh, virus binds spike uh, the ACE2 receptor on the surface, and then two two cleavage events have to occur, one at the furin cleavage site and one at Tempris 2, uh, the, the uh, other site, which is by Tempris 2, and that is required for fusion. And so if you have cell surface Tempris 2, the spike will be cleaved at the surface and the virus will fuse and, and the genome gets in. In other cells where there's no cell surface Tempris 2, uh, there's the virus can be taken up by endocytosis and then there are proteases in the endosome that will, that will cleave the spike and allow entry. So... Making this really clear for the students, there's two ways that we teach that envelope viruses can enter, either at the plasma membrane or by endosomal entry. And in this case, SARS-CoV-2 can do both. At yeah. least the Wuhan original strain was good at that, or isolate, uh, yeah. So, And yeah, a few weeks ago, which episode right. was it? We talked about the Omicron difference. It was mm-hmm. I don't know the 879. 879, that's it. They're all um, mushing together now. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was eight something. Um, uh, Ins- we talked a about- A syncytia of twibs in our y- brains. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> o- Omicron has a distinct preference for the, um, the get ingested in the cell pathway rather than the absorbed at the cell surface. So yeah, Omicron- There has a change in the, f- in the other cleavage site, which is cleaved by furans, so yeah. other proteases. And- so that makes it not efficient to get in by by the cell surface. So it goes in by supposedly by endosome. So, and that we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss that more as we go so through this, this paper. So we have at the moment three antivirals for oh, do you know Richard Plemper, right, Kathy? Yes, yes. I'm sorry you missed. Uh, I'm sorry you missed. Uh, I know. Nigner. I wanted to be there, but I couldn't. How how uh, do you know him now? You were in Atlanta, right? Or uh, outside? I know him because yeah. Well, he was at Emory, and so my former student Marty Moore was at Emory. So I met okay. him there originally, and then we were on study section together, and yeah, just have kept right. in touch. Anyway, he was very good. He was very clear. Mm-hmm. Yes, I liked it very much. Um, so uh, he, we have three antivirals di- which inhibit viral processes, right? We have remdesivir and molnupiravir, which target the polymerase, and then Paxlovid uh, for a protease. Uh, But you can also make antivirals that inhibit host proteins or cell proteins, which, you know, we have an HIV antiviral that blocks uh, the co-receptor, for example. Um, So this this paper describes uh, such an antiviral compound. And I think the... um, the development of it is quite interesting, um, as you'll see. So they they develop compounds that are active against temperance. They check them in uh, cells in culture and then in uh, in animals. And these um, these compounds, these inhibitors of temperance two, have previously been tested against uh, influenza virus because influenza virus HA is also cleaved by temperance family members. It sounds funny, family members. Right? Family members, yes. Let's go visit the Tempresses tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so these are called peptidomimetics because the, the drugs mimic uh, the, the peptide, that's the substrate uh, for the protease. They fit into the active site and uh, inhibit it. But so they, cool, the- when they fit into the active site, then they have a ketobenzothiazole warhead Attached. It's just great. That's I the love term that. They use. I had not seen that in drug development terminology before. So, is that the way peptidomimetics always work by by 
effectively blocking the active site. They kind of are a, a, a decoy substrate or something. Is I that believe the, way to think of the ones I, I know of. So. That's okay. my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Like the first really effective ones were against uh, HIV, right? And they were sitting mm -hmm. into the active site. And okay. so, um, but you know, I hate nowadays, Kathy, I hate to say always anymore. Because <laughs> right. You never know what's going to we'll bite We'll you, get right? a letter. No, no, they don't always do that. Right. So they had previously designed these tetrapeptidomimetic tetrapeptides. So, you know, four uh, amino acid moieties with ketobenzothiazole warheads, which you'll learn about in a moment. And they've been shown to be active against uh, one of these host tempuses and also uh, modestly against influenza virus. So they started to play, the chemists went to work on these and started to modify them. And then um, they would see the effects of the modifications. So uh, they put various moieties at the end terminus, for example. Um, and when they did that, when they put these modifications on, it really increases the half-life of the compound. That is how long it's going to sit around in, in fluids. Um, so uh, they also increased the activity against influenza viruses. So in this paper, they make a library of peptidomimetic compounds, and they screen them for inhibiting uh, Tempress 2. Uh, and so they, they, they produce the protease in cells. So they have the gene encoding Tempress 2. They make them in, in Vero cells. Uh, and then they make a, a version with a single amino acid change in the active site that completely destroys catalytic activity uh, of the protease. Uh, and then they have a substrate, which if it's cleaved by Templess, will release uh, a fluorogenic substrate. So it will, it will fluoresce. And so you can measure that pretty readily and you can do high throughput screenings. It's quite nice. Um, and um, so they, they showed the assay works uh, and then they uh, test inhibition with the various compounds. And they have a whole series of them with different numbers, which you can't remember. Yes. <laughs> I only remember one, 0385, which is the one that works the best in the end. <laughs> and the others work, some of them not at all, some of them less so. Um, so they have the first generation, NO100, no inhibition. And then when they add the N-terminal modifications, uh, then that's 130 and 438, they have increased inhibitory activity. So it went from zero to... 72% and 84%. Um, and they do some other modifications. And basically they end up with some that are actually better than camostat. So camostat is a previously known, camostat mesylate is a previously developed, actually, what is it, for, for pancreatic, pancreatitis. And it turns out to inhibit tempresses. But some of the compounds they've made are more active than camostat. Uh, so, you know, and Camostat has been tested in a clinical trial for uh, SARS-CoV-2. I don't think it worked very well. I have that in the discussion. Uh, okay, so that's a single dose inhibition, right, where they have a 10 nanomolar and they test for inhibition of these different compounds. And they, they do a dose response curve where basically they're adding increasing amounts of, of the drugs, increasing concentrations of four of their best family members, the ones who behave the best, right? At the, at yes. the dinner table. The ones that didn't get too drunk. <laughs> so the, then they're me measuring 50% half maximal inhibitory concentration. And so for camostat, it is 17 and a half nanomolar. For 100 N1030, 3.1 nanomolar. For 438, it was 5.2, et cetera. And the best one is 0385. It's 1.9 nanomolar. So, so it's much, pretty good. Yeah, much different from the camostat, which is yes. 17 and yeah. a half, down yeah. to 1.9. Yeah, so we dropped almost an order of magnitude in concentration for right. effect of it. And dose. at 10 micromolar, none of them made Vero cells sick, apparently. Right. <laughs> um, and then they did a, a cool experiment where they took off the ketobenzothiazole warhead. <laughs> they disarmed <laughs> it, yes. <laughs> they replaced it with a with a hydroxyl and alcohol. And so they say we expected would no longer trap 
the target protease. So I guess the warhead helps it to, and we'll see some confirmation of that, to stick into the active site. And in fact, when you take out the warhead, that's it. It doesn't work. Um, no reduction in activity. Zero. Yeah. So the warhead is important. Yes. And it also... Uh, and that's, the, it's a critical to do little checks like that along the way when you think you're developing a drug rationally, you want to know that it works the way you think it works. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, because that way, if you have to modify it, you might be yeah, able to Yeah, you can modify it intelligently. So I like that. So rational drug design as opposed to irrational drug design. Yes. Well, there's, <laughs> there's high throughput screening that's done with just yeah, big yeah, libraries sure. of compounds that um, is not as tailored as this. Um. So they um, also showed that this works against murine tempress. So they're going to do a mouse experiment. This is important, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you can't, if it didn't inhibit the murine tempress, you couldn't do that. Uh, and then they produced an, a series of other proteases. So I want to know how specific this is for inhibition. Other proteases, three members of the TTSP family. And furin, thrombin, and cathepsin L. So cathepsin L is actually the protease in the endosome that can cleave the spike if if SARS-CoV-2 should get there. And there, this compound is inactive against the other proteases, uh, which is cool because even camistat has some activity against thrombin. So why is this important? Well, it's likely to have fewer side effects if it doesn't inhibit other right. things, right? I mean, you can't test everything, unfortunately, right? So off-target inhibition you're not going to know about, and that could give you a problem. But that's why you do uh, safety studies. But they picked, these seem like logical choices. They're all serine proteases that are kind of similar, and you, you might expect this drug to inhibit them, and it doesn't. Yeah. All right, so the, the benzo, keto benzo thiazole warhead is important, and you can get a nice specific um, inhibitor with that on there. So they want to know how does this fit into the active site. So they don't have a structure of Tempress 2, but they can model it. And there is what's called a catalytic triad. There are three amino acids that happen to be serine, histidine, and asparagine. And uh, when they dock in their drug, it looks like it can make a, uh, a covalent bond uh, with the catalytic site, the catalytic triad. Um, so very tight, right? It's not going to get out. It's, so that would maybe account for its increased potency. And so now they see the, so you can see the interaction of the drug. Oh, what is it? Oh, 30, 385, oh, 385 with, yeah. with specific amino acids. And as they said, we could modify it further if we had to. So that's why this is important to do, right? It's very cool. All right, so now this, this drug inhibits Tempress. What about virus infection? So they use KLU cells, uh, can lung cancer, human lung cancer cells, and they pre treat them with 100 nanomole of uh, the compound for three hours, and then they infect them with uh, an original <laughs> yes. isolate. SARS-CoV-2 OG. OG. Yeah, and, and you know it's important to point out that this is an experiment where they're sort of doing the prophylaxis side yes. of it's right. the, the uh, it's title. Right. So they're trying to prevent infection, not trying to stop infection that has already occurred in these cells. Correct. And so they um, use as a control the, the O100, which doesn't have an N-terminal moiety, doesn't have a warhead. And they initially look at Viral double-stranded RNA and nucleocapsid protein as a measure of infection and look for the inhibitory profile uh, of the drug. And the uh, O385 and reduces those levels by 83%. And the O100 without the warhead, less than 25%. They tried a few other uh, compounds as well, but they're not as good as 385. Um, actually, 386... Uh, but this is, yeah, that that's just a, a restored one uh, that they checked. So uh, these, this compound can and, and related ones can inhibit 
uh, viral RNA synthesis and nucleocapsid protein synthesis. Uh, they also do a dose response so they can get an IC50 for camistat or EC50. Uh, camistat is 10 nanomolar and for 385, it's 1.4 nanomolar. And so like before, tenfold better. No toxicity. So they have now two newly discovered peptidomimetics. 385 and 386 are very potent, low, low nanomolar inhibitors of uh, infection, at least in these uh, lung cancer cells. So uh, I want to ask you a little more about the you know, just the statement, no toxicity, because yeah. the big picture, you know, we think of what, if you're going to make a drug that's going to attack a cellular enzyme is that you have to really worry that you're going to sure. not have it be toxic and destroy some important cell function because Tempris 2 is not there to let SARS-CoV-2 right. in. Tempris 2 <laughs> is there for the cell to do something. And if you're going to inhibit that, yeah. how is that going to... So. You know, I, I have to admit, I didn't read it in great depth to see, you know, what kinds of toxicity assays they did, um, or do they just, you know, the cells seem alive. So the cells aren't dead toxic. yet, so it's non-toxic. So yeah. they, add, they add increasing amounts until the cells basically die. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is a big deal, but you can imagine that at lower concentrations, you would have subtle effects that you're not seeing, which could be damaging in the long term, right? So- I think if this drug at 10 nanomolar killed the cells, that would be the end of it, right? Yes. Yep. And and so they're doing um, basically uh, sort of looking at a comparison between what is the uh, cell death with the drug in infected cells versus what is the cell death with the drug without infection. Yeah. Um, and kind of looking for specificity um, as well as, um, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Um, so yeah, they specifically were looking at sort of specificity uh, to try to make sure, um, and this is the selectivity index, um, to see that it's specifically impacting only the cells when they have um, virus and not cells that do not have virus, as well as looking at the uh, cell death. Right. Yeah, so the, if they go up, so they're looking for the concentration that kills half of the cells. Right, 50% cytotoxic concentration. It's over one millimolar, which is good. But that's only one measure of toxicity, right? So if this drug makes it through the animal studies, then they do a whole battery of other kinds of toxicity in animals and cells, which are way beyond this to yeah. address, you know, any other potential issues. They, is it, and the if the this mantra were, of a program like this is fail early. Fail early, so exactly right. You, yes. you, want to, you want to do your cheapest experiments up front. You go in an immortalized cell line. You see if it inhibits virus. Does it inhibit virus without killing the cells? How high do we have to go in concentration to kill the cells? Yes. And we're not going to get much more toxicity information out of these cells, really. No, so to answer your question, Kathy, there are other more subtle measures for yes. sure as you go down the line. But at this right. point, yeah. And right. at some point, they will dose mice with up to grams if necessary until they die. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And rats and whatever their animals too. Yeah. Right. And if this were a nucleoside analog, they would do genotoxicity, right? To see mm -hmm. if it's changing DNA and so forth. But yeah. Yeah. yeah no, killing they're, cells they're, is not enough. <laughs> yeah. No. They're, they're basically just showing us that it's not bleach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, virus, the virus goes away, but it's not because it's bleach. But I heard you could take bleach. <laughs> All right. I yeah, wouldn't recommend true. it. <laughs> All right. So uh, next, they ask, uh, "Let's do a black assay and measure yes. infectious virus production. This. We can infect cells uh, with the with or without the drug." They use now. now that is, these are Kalu cells. I, I guess I missed the. Uh, oh, maybe that's coming up. Yeah, that's coming up. Kalu cells. They infect them two doses of the drug, forty nanomolar and two hundred nanomolar. They take the supernate and they do a black assay. And these two treatments with N0385 reduce titers by a hundredfold, almost a hundredfold. And the, the one where they took the warhead, where they dearmed it, they, it does not reduce plaque formation. So this is the first indication that you can, in fact, inhibit uh, virus production by uh, using this. 
So KALUs are cancer cells, they say. They're immortalized. So, you know, who knows what's happening? So let's use a more relevant model. They, they happen to use colonoids, which are um, donor-derived col colonoids, which are little uh, assemblages of cells that kind of approximate um, parts of the, of the intestine. So they're going to do they, a gut check. A good gut check. They say they do this because, you know, there's some evidence that maybe the virus can reproduce in the intestine. I, yeah. they, they're also in respiratory organoids that you can use as well or, or uh, air layer interface cultures that we've talked about. Okay, but it's fine. Uh, and um, they show that the drugs also inhibit uh, virus infection in colonoids as well. My guess was that one of them had these colonoids handy. Yeah, I'd probably. Um, <laughs> there was some. There was some reason, or they'd worked with them before and knew how to. Yeah. It was, the, but it's the, a perfectly. The, it's a perfectly reasonable system. It's fine, but the the respiratory. I mean, these cultures are not easy to do. So if yeah. you don't have. I mean, I think they take months to grow. We we uh, Amy has had some experience with that. And in one episode where she was talking about it, it takes a long time. It's quite expensive, and not everyone can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the drug works in in colonoids as well. All right, so then they say, what about some variants of concern with this? There are no changes in this site, the cleaver site, but let's just check anyway. Uh, they check 117-1351 and P1 and 617. Also alpha, known as what? alpha, delta. beta, gamma, and delta. Thank you very much. Alpha, and beta, that is gamma, where the delta. list ends. Unfortunately, they didn't. There Omicron are no letters after delta. <laughs> this... Uh, would have been interesting, but the paper was submitted likely before that. But yeah, this, uh, this paper drug, it was actually submitted um, May of 2021, and yeah. finally accepted March of 2022. So it's been in press for a while. And, and so what you said is that none of these variants have changes in the Tempris two cleavage site. Is that? Did I yeah, understand Tempris that right? Yeah, Tempris two cleavage site. That's right. Right. Yeah. So and you wouldn't the, expect there to be a difference with this drug, right? But no. that's what they're going to check. No, okay. so those were check the variants it. they had available at the time. Yeah, <clears throat> and this the same activity, low nanomolar range uh, inhibits infection with those. But it would be interesting to check Omicron because, um, as we said earlier, Omicron has a change in the furin cleavage site, which right makes it more likely to in, in, enter through endocytosis. And we did a paper, as we said, on an earlier twib where they used camistat and showed that Omicron is less sensitive to camistat as a consequence. So, uh, so it would it be interesting be because, as you know, Omicron yes. is uh, predominating. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brian. What did you say? Oh, I just, so, it, so you would predict that this would be even, it would be quite a bit less sensitive here. Yes. Yeah. I mean, would it be less sensitive to uh, preclude a, a therapeutic effect in people? I don't know. You would have to find out. But the thing is, what if, what what level of, like if, if we're tenfold, if you needed tenfold more drug to inhibit Omicron, would that be something you would go forward with? Because Omicron is predominating right now everywhere, right? So yeah. I don't know. I just don't I know. It, I guess it would partially depend on what that level of toxicity was. Yes. Yeah. And but this, I mean, it kind of, um, in a in a way, those findings with Omicron not really using Tempris two kind of undercut the theory behind this paper, which is that by targeting uh, what we think is a fundamental mechanism the virus needs, <laughs> we're going to obviate the need to um, to develop you know additional antivirals yeah, as more yeah. variants come along because the fear with antivirals that target viral mechanisms is that the virus can evolve ways around them. Um, the theory here was the virus wouldn't be able to evolve something that's constant in the host and the host is not going to change. So that's the whole idea behind targeting host mechanisms. But it turns out that this particular host mechanism is something that the virus may in fact be changing its approach yeah. to. And not from any pressure from drug either. No, just uh, You're not doing any selection. what's going on with Omicron. So the idea that cell targets you can't overcome. It's not true. I mean, it may be less frequent, but there are resistance to the CCR5 inhibitors of uh, HIV-1. There are other, there's a drug that inhibits polio replication and it targets 
a cell protein, you can get resistance to that too. Right. So it just may be more difficult. It depends but. on how dependent the virus is on that particular host mechanism. Yeah. Anyway, if it were a hundred, if Omicron were a hundredfold less sensitive, then I don't think you go forward with this at the moment. But I just don't know because yeah. uh, it wouldn't be worth using. Anyway, they didn't do some mouse experiments. Uh, can we're going to look in a mouse? And they use um, a transgenic mouse, uh, transgenic for ACE2, uh, with a strong promoter. And these mice can actually die after infection. Although it's not clear to me why they die because the the lung pathology is not so severe. It is, it, in these mice, the virus actually infects the brain, which may be, I'm, at least for SARS-1, that was why uh, these mice died after infection. I remember Stan Perlman said, you know, it's an un, it's an abnormal path, uh, model, but at least if you can infect, if you can prevent virus replication with a drug and prevent death, it's showing that it works in an animal yeah. model. It's ACE2 driven by a keratin promoter. Uh, and again, so they, do, the, do the cheaper experiment and see if it fails. And if it doesn't, then you proceed to the more expensive experiments with yeah. animal models maybe, that might be maybe, better replicants. Yeah, maybe non-human primates or ferrets or something. Ferrets, yeah. A single, so they, they have um, mice... They give, uh, they, they, oh, this is interesting. Now they're going to give it intranasally, all right? Yes. So this is not injected, sprayed into the nose. And um, they give them a dose, a single daily intranasal dose for eight days, uh, day minus one to day six. So the day before infection, they get challenged intranasally with 1,000 PFU. And then they keep giving them intranasal drug for... Eight uh, eight days total, and they have also a, a saline control and the drug without the warhead, right? And the controls and the warhead free drug treated mice, they lost fourteen to twelve percent of their weight. The three eighty five treated mice lost only three percent of their weight. Most of the saline and warhead free mice died. By six to nine days, and on, and seventy percent of the treated mice, O three eight five treated mice survived. So that's an effect preventing. So this death. is testing prophylactic use. Pro prophylactic, yeah. giving it a day before infection. That's right. Well, prophylactic and prolonged. Yes. Yeah. Prophylactic yeah, and during point, infection. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's also really interesting when you look at these data. Um, they indicate the difference between the male and the female mice, mm. um, and all of the mice who died in the drug-treated group were males. Um, it was basically three males died, and huh. all the rest of the mice seemed fine. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, it par parallels the severity in, in humans, right? Yeah. Had they some histological examination of the lung, and it is where they say mild pathology in most of the mice, um, you know, with... Without drug, a little more changes, but nothing really severe. Um, there is an effect on viral protein and viral titers of the drug. Um, but my, my, I was a little surprised because there's really, I, I don't understand why the mice are dying because there's very little pathology. Nevertheless, the drug prevents them from dying. Then they did another experiment where they just treated the mice for four days and this worked well. Also, uh, they actually had 100% survival in the treated group compared to 20% survival. So where you said that there wasn't much difference in the pathology, that are, are we looking at figure 4G? Because the histopathology seems strikingly different between yeah. the treated and the... Yeah, there are differences. Saline and alcohol controls. Yeah, yeah. so... It is there is a difference for sure, but they summarize it as mild pathology in most, hmm. of them. even the ones without the drug. Yes, even though there's a difference, it's still pretty mild in their view. They're saying it. Whoa. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't yeah. know. It looks like nice spongy lung <laughs> for the untreated and the drug treated, and then everything is like full of inflammatory cells in the 
saline control and the no warhead control. But yeah. Yeah. No, you're right, but I'm just quoting I've, them. Okay. Mild pathology in most infected mice. Um, so then they, as I said, they did a four-day course and that works quite well. Um, they look at viral titers and protein production as well. So, uh, in fact, the treated mice, no infectious virus in the lung at the study endpoint, but also no infectious virus in two saline treated mice that survived. Yes. Quite interesting. So a shorter regimen works as well. Uh, and then finally, they they did this experiment with Delta. Um, I think now they're using a single dose. So they... They're using a single dose and it's also 12 not hours. prophylactic. It's right. now therapeutic. Yeah, it's 12 hours after infection, right? Um, and this protects against weight loss. Uh, and it also uh, reduces virus titers and uh, viral antigen in the lung and improves the pathology scores. So they say 1.9 fold because they quantify the pathology uh, compared to the, uh, the uh, control mice. Anyway, it works against Delta, which is not unexpected and a, a, a uh, one dose, 12 hours. And one thing that was very interesting that Richard Plemper said, he said, you know, in, in ferrets and mice, you have a really compressed clinical course. So you don't have a lot of time to treat animals. You have less time than in humans. So it's often hard to predict, uh, you know, what how it's going to work in people. So anyway, this is an interesting uh, drug candidate. You yeah. have a <laughs> cell target. It seems to be effective in the, in the models that they've looked at. Uh, and um, the... Um, I suppose uh, they may be going into, well, they're going to do more preclinical work in animals, but maybe get into people as well. And this is interesting because it's intranasal, very easy to administer, right? Yeah. So that, is taking a pill, a pill, I suppose. And and they also, um, they mentioned maybe using this against other viruses as well, because Tempris 2, I mean, as you discussed, um, mm -hmm. it's not, SARS-CoV-2 is not the only virus that uses this. So... <clears throat> If it does work, I mean, I, I was, I may have sounded a little down on it because Omicron may not need this mechanism as much, but we don't actually know. That experiment hasn't been done yet. This may may be effective at some dose against Omicron. Um, but in addition, it may be effective against other viruses. And the intranasal administration is really cool um, in, in at least a couple of ways. First of all, that's a really easy way to deliver a drug. Second, um, if you're trying to prevent a respiratory virus infection or treat, you know, it's mm. in the nasal passages in the lung, so that seems like a great route to go in through. Yeah. Um, and third, it might help minimize any any toxicities you're going to get because yeah. you're targeting the the respiratory pathway. You're not going into the bloodstream. Um, maybe you'd be able to minimize side effects, and and we don't know what the side effects might be of hitting Tempris 2, and we're not going to know until they go into many more systems, I think. Probably some of it gets in the blood, I would guess. Oh, sure. Right. I'm sure some of it's going to get taken up, but it would be at a lower dose than you might yeah. get in the blood with other, yep. depending on the pharmacokinetics of this. They also say that maybe we could use these in combination with the existing antivirals, yes. right? Well, the other point here is they say, we envision our use for unvaccinated individuals or those with high risk of exposure or severe disease outcome. So even vaccinated people, you know, who have a, can have a severe d disease outcome because they don't respond well. Maybe this would help them. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, people now are saying, oh, even if you're vaccinated, you know, if you have symptoms, you should take a monoclonal or Paxlovid right away. And here they could do this nasal spray. So yeah. good work. Um, what I thought it was interesting is they summarized some other um, candidates that are in investigation hit, that hit uh, cell targets. Uh, and they, they these are host-acting HDAs. One is plitidepsin, a newly, a naturally occurring inhibitor protects, protected against lung pathology in this mouse model. Uh, it targets, this is weird, I thought, it targets... Elongation factor one, alpha one. 
So that's a cell translation protein, right? Which is needed yeah. for protein synthesis. And so it's weird that it wouldn't have um, side effects, right? Unless it's it's um, redundant and there's another one. And for some reason, the virus requires this one. I don't know. So that thought that was unusual. Uh, then they have Camistat, of course, um, which is in which is in a human trial for SARS-CoV-2, but they say no significant protection against infection was observed in the adenovirus ACE2 model, where they deliver ACE2 by adenovirus vector. And then there's another one, nafam, nafamostat mesolate. <laughs> it's another one. I guess it's a temp. Yeah, it's a TTSB inhibitor. Um, so then they say, oh, recently reported clinical trial data for camistat treatment of hospitalized patients demonstrated a lack of impact on time to recovery, which is not surprising because if you're treating a hospitalized patient, as Daniel would say, it's kind of late to give them an yeah. antiviral. Uh, you have to, and that's with the story with remdesivir. When they started treating people earlier, you had a better impact on uh, time to recovery and incidence of death. Anyway, so we'll see if this makes it further. We'll follow it. And I bet the Omicron experiments are done already. Uh, they're just waiting to be collated because that's... Right. Easy Watch enough for to another do. paper in Nature. You yeah. bet. <laughs> <laughs> another Nature paper. Nature. If it works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes, I would like to save the changes. Let's do a couple of emails. Kathy, can you do the first one? Sure. Tim writes, hi, Twiv team. Listening to episode 890's discussion on infection interval affecting the immune response, I was reminded of Daniel Griffin's comments on one of the differences between vaccination and infection-based immunity. His take is that when you get infected, you don't really know what the infectious dose was or the viral titers during infection, so you don't really know what your immune system was exposed to. This variable of differing, quote, doses could have an effect on the quality of the immune response. After all, we wouldn't tolerate our doctors administering a random amount of vaccine. We would want a controlled dose with predictable response. I'm wondering if this could be a contributing factor to the infection interval study that might not be applicable to vaccine schedules. My guess would be that the closer an infection was to the most recent vaccine, the virus would be cleared faster and would not reach as high, a peak, high of a peak burden due to residual circulating antibodies, etc., by the time somebody reaches six months post-vaccination, circulating antibodies would be mostly gone and the virus would be able to have a more productive infection, at least initially. So in addition to the time interval between vaccination and infection, a confounding variable might just be differences in the amount of viral antigen the immune system is exposed to, with longer intervals leading to higher viral loads, leading to a more robust immune response. All this is not to say that the interval doesn't matter from the perspective of maturation of the immune response, as other papers you have covered using vaccine schedules clearly show a role. Thoughts? Love the show. Thanks for all you do. Tim. Uh, seems like, yeah, you should be considering the fact that there's random doses in <clears throat> infections and that that sure. is going to make a difference in what you learn about intervals. Yeah, I, I, when I think about intervals, I would mostly want to do intervals based on vaccine studies yeah. um, for the reasons that Tim points out. Mm -hmm. Although the one challenge study that we looked at, they had reasonably uniform responses, right? Because they were giving everybody the same dose, right? Right. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a reasonable, uh, and it's a good reason to get vaccinated even if you've been infected, right? Because that way you get a fixed dose. Doses makes sense to me. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Dave writes, hi, Twivers, pre-COVID listener. I was under the impression that China's Sinovac vaccine was terrible compared to the current crop of mRNA vaccines due to the early clinical trial results. And my assumption that a killed vaccine would not induce decent T-cell immunity. I did not expect Sinovac to confer durable protection against variants, since I assumed it would induce a primarily humoral response. However, this preprint from HKU, and he gives a link, claims that three shots of Sinovac is very effective against severe disease, even in Omicron. 
Um, and he, he quotes, we estimated three doses of both vaccines offered a very high protection against severe disease, uh, 98.1% with the 95% confidence interval of 97.1 to 98.8. And mortality, 98.6% um, with the confidence interval 97.7 to 99.2, which was sustained within all age groups. Vaccine estimates were very similar for both vaccines against severe and fatal outcomes. Three doses of BNT162B2 was estimated to have a vaccine efficacy of 71.5%, a confidence interval 54.5 to 82.1 against mild, moderate disease in younger adults, while for three doses of CoronaVac, the VE was estimated at 42.3%, um, 95% confidence interval 11.4 to 62.4 against the same outcome. How does this work? I assume Sinovac has not been updated due to an Omicron strain formulation and is still using parental Wuhan strain, but have no data. Do coronavirus particles that have been killed with beta probiolactone still transduce cells and produce antigens like an mRNA vaccine? Thanks for any discussion and correction of my mistaken assumptions. Uh, Dave is in Oakland. Um, I have not looked at these data yet, Dave. So I can't fully uh, address um, your question. I think that my question is sort of how long is this sustained protection um, that they are looking at? Uh, you know, you mentioned durable immunity, and I don't know how durable it is. Um, some of these numbers, particularly the one of the numbers you quote, does seem a little low, but I, I just don't know the data well enough to really comments. I think if you give a third dose you get a broadening of the of the neutralization profile, right? Like you see with mRNA right. vaccines. Of course. But but as you said, we don't know how long it's going to last. Um but his fundamental right. question is, you know, is the inactivated vaccine acting like an mRNA vaccine? And I would say no. Yeah, I would right? say no. I certainly um, hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um I would say no. So um, the sort of, I don't know, canon is that an inactivated vaccine um, is generally going to give you primarily humor response um, mm -hmm. by le leading to antibody production. Um, that's not to say that it gives you no T cell immune response, um, particularly CD4 yeah. response, um, because some of the vaccine will get uh, phagocytosed or endocytosed um, to get presented on MHC class two for CD4s, um, you'll get a little bit of cross presentation of that phagocytose material to get onto class one. And so um, it might be a bit less um, T cell simulation, but it shouldn't be none. And um, I have been involved in immunologist arguments about mm -hmm. um, exactly how much um, that would be compared to the mRNA vaccine where we know that all of the um, protein is being made intracellularly. So I think there should be some T cell immunity, um, though my opinion is not as much, um, but I have been involved in debates on that point. The other thing that uh, strikes me, so this study is out of Hong Kong, as they say, it's, they use data. So they mine data about who's vaccinated and what happened to them. So it's an observational study. And you can find similar observational studies that have a very different outcome. I saw one recently where it was in, this, in the California health system, probably Kaiser Permanente. They mine millions of records, right? And the, the outcome is very different, that there's not as much protection. And if you can find other studies where it's good protection against severe disease and hospitalization. And Richard Plemper said, you can't really compare... <laughs> clinical trial results in different places because every they're all done differently and they're different populations. It's very hard to compare them. And it's not a clinical trial. It's an observational study, which has even more caveats. So I think it's, you know, it's what you have with this vaccine, but it doesn't mean it would be the same everywhere. And this right. is an observational study specifically during the Omicron wave in Hong Kong yeah. where we you had an outbreak of the virus that reached relatively high levels. Um, this variant is different in a lot of ways from earlier ones that were used in clinical trials, um, or not used, that were, that were tested against in clinical trials. Um, and 
you know, the Hong Kong had a very different experience of this than other places because they were zero COVID for a long time. And so you have a largely unexposed population seeing Omicron as their first infection against a background of vaccination rates. Yeah, you got different outcomes. Yeah, yeah I, you know, and I would look back at these data. The difference against severe disease is not, there's really no difference between these two vaccine groups. Uh, both would be considered as very high. Um but uh, the difference that they point out here in vaccine efficacy with uh, against mild moderate disease um, is is I, I don't have the statistics, but looking at the confidence intervals, they seem um, somewhat far apart. <laughs> yes. um, based on the the mean vaccine efficacies uh, that they're showing here. So I, I don't know that you could say that these are exactly the same. And what do you mean by moderate? <laughs> Right. There's always a question in these studies because sometimes moderate, yeah. you, you read what the parameters were and you say, wow, I don't want moderate yeah. disease. You know, the best number is death because there's no question. There's about no question that, that it happened. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, and if, but unfortunately in many studies, there's not a lot of deaths in either group. So it's hard right. to get the numbers. I mean, fortunately, most. unfortunately, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fortunate. And especially in younger kids, right? There are very few yeah. deaths often. So you, you can't depend on death. You have to do hospitalization, which I think is a difficult one because that can vary Yeah, in different places. So anyway, I think it's fine that the, a third dose of this vaccine works because many people are getting it, right? Yeah. Although maybe not in Hong Kong, right? <laughs> All right, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Wendy writes, Dear Vincent and crew, this is Wendy Zhu, a recently defended PhD student from UT Austin. Congratulations, Wendy. While other people are writing to thank you for providing objective scientific information to the public about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, I am writing to thank you all for your long-term education efforts for the public. And it is really due to Vincent and Twiv's education effort that I decided to start on a virology research training path and now a PhD with a dissertation focusing on retrovirus. Okay, so I guess we're to blame. Sorry, um, but, but welcome. Yeah. In episode 884, when Vincent was complaining to Amy that Columbia did not have, a vi have virology lectures in the basic frontiers in science class, which is required for every student, I was literally shouting saying, yeah, that was exactly what happened in my undergraduate training. Even as an undergrad biochemistry major, we did not have a virology class. And that was the time, 2013, I looked for an online virology class and found Vincent's virology on Coursera. I was so fascinated by viruses from your course and from TWIV at the time that I made up my mind to do virology research, although my undergrad institute did not have a single virus research lab. Eventually, I got admitted to the PhD program at UT Austin mm -hmm. and started working on viruses. When I just joined UT, you held the number 500 epitope on our campus. <laughs> My lab mate got a TWIV t-shirt and I was so jealous, <laughs> but it was so nice and enjoyable to see you live at the time. And I was even more excited and very honored when I found out one of my co-authored papers published on MBio earlier this year, provides a link, was actually edited by Vincent. You know what? When we realized this, we did multiple passes of proofreading before we returned <laughs> it to you. <laughs> I will attend the Cold Spring Harbor 50 Years of Reverse Transcriptase meeting in late April, and I noticed from the program book that you were holding a TWIV there. I am not sure who else will be there, but I believe at least Vincent will be there. I am presenting a poster at the meeting, so if you have time, come and check out my poster in the poster session right after your TWIV session. It is a different story than the MBio paper you edited. Thank you again for your long-term education on viruses and science for the whole public. I am sure there are many other trainees out there inspired by Vincent and the TWIV team and starting their virology research journey. I'm very grateful to you for you all. Uh, I'm very grateful for all you've been doing. Thanks for reading this long letter. P.S. My weather in Austin should be the same as what Rich is experiencing. Very sunny, 62 to 89 Fahrenheit, and blue bonnets are blooming everywhere in Austin. Sincerely, Wendy. Cool. Um, who was at UT Austin. Very cool. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed Wendy at the meeting that I was at last week. Did you record a TWIF? Yeah, we did at the 50 years of reverse trends. Actually, it's 52 because they wanted to hold this. They want it right. <laughs> before, but it was canceled several times. But a, but a darn coronavirus interfered with it. Yeah. Yes. So the, the anniversary was 1970. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was actually 52 years of reverse trends. I was there, recorded it to have, and uh, 
hopefully get it out one of these days. I'm sorry okay. I missed you, Wendy. Yeah, Wendy looks like she's in Jackie Dudley's lab. Yeah. And Jackie has been on Twiv. So I remember yeah. that. And Jackie Dudley was at the meeting. Yeah. Uh, Ginny writes, I'm afraid I'm about a week behind, so someone else may have already told you this. No worries. We're way behind on letters. On the April 1st show, you mentioned that the bagel joint has a picture on the wall of a bagel with locks with the caption, this is not a bagel. This is a joking reference to the painting, The Treachery of Images by René Magritte, which shows a pipe with the words, ceci n'est pas un pipe, which translates to this is not a pipe. Magritte meant that it was the representation of a pipe, not an actual pipe. Takeoffs on this, like the one in the bagel store, are an in-joke, since only people familiar with the painting get the joke. The bagel joint wasn't saying that a bagel with lox and cream cheese wasn't a proper bagel. It was making a joking allusion to art history. And yes, I wasn't on this twiv, was I? I don't know, but yes, <laughs> you're right. I I, yeah. In fact, I saw the Magritte a couple of days ago, and it hit me. You're, and I had read yep. your letter, and I said, oh my gosh, yes. And I had forgotten that, because I've seen that picture, that painting many times. So cool. I didn't think a bagel joint would have that. <laughs> it's cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. In case you're ever up here and crave a New York style bagel, bagel, the best bagels in greater Rochester, New York are made by bagel land. They do offer maple bacon cream cheese, which is delicious. They also sell bagel dogs, which is where they wrap a Rochester made Zweigel's hot dog, which has pork and bagel dub for cooking it. They are delicious and absolutely treff. <laughs> You can also get a pizza bagel with pepperoni and cheese. Also, Treff. <laughs> the store isn't kosher, but their water bagels are the real thing. <laughs> hey, best to you all, Ginny. I love it. Treff. Treff. I had to look it up, but I, now I get it. Yeah. It's the opposite kosher. of kosher. Kosher. Okay. Uh, Kathy, let's do a couple more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Patrick writes, Dear Twiv, I'm listening to your episode on yellow fever vaccines, and it seems that you are unaware that Sanofi is currently in a phase two trial of a new yellow fever, va fever vaccine. I am in the trial here in Boston, having been jabbed with either the existing vaccine or the experimental one back in January. And uh, Patrick gives a link mm. to the clinical trials. Keep up the good work. And uh, Vincent, you've made a note. This is the same African isolate grown in cell culture. So yeah. I'm not sure what that means. Explain a little so more. So the, uh, the the yellow fever vaccine, the YF17D, is is grown in eggs, but it's derived from an African strain called a CB. Okay. And this is just the same virus grown in cell culture. And so the observation from the last TWIV, last week from Kartik and his colleagues, very interesting is that in Brazil, antibodies induced by that vaccine don't neutralize Brazilian isolates. But nobody checked before, and it probably has been happening a long time, and maybe it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, right, Brianne, that's what you and I have yeah. kind of discussed <laughs> offline, which is, you know, their idea is that in Brazil, the virus changed its different population. It's different from the ACB virus from Africa, so it's not neutralized well by ACB-induced antibodies, but it still protects. <laughs> and whether or not not neutralized well um, does not mean not. not neutralized at all. Yeah. Right. So the uh, there have been some outbreaks in Brazil, but they think it's because they are they don't have a lot of vaccines, so they divide up the doses to spread to cover more people and therefore you don't get a good response. But the, the non-neutralization is probably not an issue. Anyway, it's a long way of saying that you can make the same vaccine in cell culture. It doesn't really matter. It'll probably still protect. And uh, I don't think you need to change the vaccine to match the Brazilian isolate because people are still protected. What's Do you think the, it would give less side effects, fewer side effects? In because cell the culture, 17D I, is supposed to be pretty nasty. It can be, yeah. I don't know if it'll make a difference in cell culture. Is the idea of doing it in cell culture just for production purposes, so they're not dependent on eggs and not worried about so, people's allergies? You know, I don't. I asked this of Peter Palazzi once, who's an influenza expert, yeah. right? And he said it's really easy to grow viruses in eggs. They've got the production all all straightforward. Cell culture is hard. You know, hundred thousand liter fermenters are are hard, and they get contaminated. You have to throw lots out. 
So I don't know if it's easier. Uh, wasn't wasn't there something at one point about glycosylation differences, at least for flu? That's mm-hmm. correct. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely right. There are glycosylation differences when you grow. And we have we had the guy from Penn on TWIV to talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, come on. I can't not remember his name because he's- It's he's, he li- H. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up here. Hensley. Because, yeah, Scott Hensley. Thank you. Oh, you have great memory. Jeez. Well, the H helped. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because we did his preprint a couple of weeks ago, and he emailed me the next day and it said, thanks, we have some more cool stuff uh, if you want me to come on. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. You, if you grow it in eggs. So maybe that's one It way. also occurs to me, um, Sanofi, which is the largest flu vaccine manufacturer in the U.S. by a long shot, has been converting over to... Um, uh, cell so, culture based yeah. flu vaccines. So it may just be a production issue that they want to be Maybe. done with eggs. And, you know, they're, they're obviously already doing a whole lot of fermenters. So why not move your, I mean, your it could be that vaccine Peter, to it? Peter is just wrong. Who knows? You know, I'm kind of <laughs> hanging on what he told me, but that's dangerous. Well, no, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> that growing, I, I'm sure he's right that growing the vaccine in um, cell culture is different. From, it's got to be very different in the production side from growing it in eggs. But what I'm saying is, you know, maybe once you've made the huge investment of converting over something like 100 million doses yeah, of flu vaccine every year, you would want to put all your stuff over to that and get it out of your egg basket. Well, it right. seems to me that <laughs> given the shortage in Brazil, it would be good to have another source, right? Yes. So, anyway. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you, Patrick. Also, um, we're having a bit of an issue with egg shortages now because of the <laughs> avian influenza. So that's right. Maybe yeah, fewer I, steps in the supply chain. I don't know. I think we the U.S. uses 150 million eggs a year to make flu vaccine. It's a lot of eggs. But that should be going down now that we're doing more cell should culture. Be. Right? Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Chris writes... Hello, Twivers. Why is it that each new strain of SARS-CoV-2 completely eclipses the previous one? One can see how one strain might have higher infectivity and a greater number of cases over time, but why do the less infective strains go away entirely instead of just continuing to spread at a low level? You can't find Delta now, but it did fine before Omicron came about. (laughs) Why did it go away? Thank you for the great podcast. Chris in Seattle. Good question. Yeah. Do, are we sure that it's not continuing to spread at a very low level that we're not picking up? <laughs> uh, if you look at the covariance.org where they do a two-week you know, summary of all the sequences, you don't see it. Hmm. Um, so, But it's a stunning replacement, right? Yeah. But every yeah. variant re- replaces the previous one. And that's the same that happens with influenza variants, right? Antigenic variants do that. I, I don't know. It's I think Omicron is very good at evading immunity, right? And Delta is not as good, but maybe Omicron is just more fit. Also, the sheer numbers of Omicron cases are so high. They're they're off the charts that if you graph Delta on there, I mean oh, yeah, it's a big difference. That the, it's the it's just enormous. Yeah. And and I when you look that, at when you look at graphs that go back to um to January of 2021 and the the post Christmas break peak that we were terribly worried about that was just the the ICUs were bursting at the seams and everything was a mess and you look at case counts from that mm. and then you look at case counts from January of 2022 with Omicron and they're up here and <laughs> it's just maybe we don't see the delta because we don't see anything but Omicron well, that's a good question because yeah even if you're more fit you would think You'd think there'd be some. There'd be some, but I, I don't understand. I don't think it's understood. I just don't know. Maybe maybe you can't be co-infected with both, and the prevalence of the later one is just so high that it could be sw- swamps out the earlier. I'm, I'm looking at the nextstrain.org that mm. we just used in our class. Yeah. And if you look really close, <laughs> there's, you know, at the very bottom... Yeah, there might be a tiny little bit of something at a frequency of one percent. Yeah, you know, so it's never clear that it completely goes away. You'd never want to say 
that. Yeah, but you it's still, bet your life on still it, a but big yeah. effect, right? It's and we huge. Don't, yeah. We still don't. I don't think we understand that. Yeah. Because. Yeah. Uh, well, and we, for that matter, I don't think we understand that for previous common cold coronaviruses, do we? Because we've talked about, we did a paper where they were looking at antibody levels in different I mean, generations you know, from the blood bank. and Presumably, you build up immunity in a population and that reduces the number of infections. And then a variant comes along that is not neutralized and so that predominates. Right. So the other one is just neutralized away or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if that can, I mean, Omicron is certainly resistant to Sierra, right? Convalescent Sierra. Yeah. I don't know if that's enough to explain it. But, and you know, Delta was not as resistant to neutralization as the previous variant. So right. I don't know if that can explain Delta emergence. I don't um, know. But you also don't need to, you don't need to have zero <laughs> transmission for a long time to make a variant disappear. That's true. From the population. I mean, if you're, if yeah. you're, if, if your effective R is below one, that, strain if we're calling them strains will go extinct yeah, right that, that could be it could and be it, that if you have enough neutralization evasion that that's enough to do it yeah uh, so and so question. delta may yeah. actually be gone or may be gone in Very some low. places um and we may not see it again ever we may not see it again for a while and you know you may say okay so now if omicron goes way down you know the trough why wouldn't Delta? Because not enough, right? There's yeah. simply not enough to not see enough, the new outbreak. And, and we do have a large amount of existing immunity now from the vaccines and from Omicron. Yeah. Also, um, if Omicron goes away, what about Pi? Yes. When are we going to get? They keep they keep naming these Omicron variants. So oh, it's the BA two. Yeah, it's the, yeah, exactly. And I think there is now a conspiracy to deprive me of my pie jokes. Exactly. I, have I want. So I would many. like to see some pie. You want pie? Yes. You want pie? I, I okay. want pie. Well, I don't know that I want pie. It may right. be, it I, may I be don't horrible, want, but I don't want there to be a virus called pie. But yes, I, no, I, I'd be fine with there not being that. But why isn't BA two called pie? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Uh, yes, we are up to Steve. Steve. Uh, hi, Vincent et al. I'm sure that Twivsters everywhere will find Michael Lewis and Al Franken give a good account of some of the fundamental shortcomings in U.S. epidemic preparedness in their discussion of Lewis's new book, The Premonition, A Pandemic Story. My only quibble would be that they don't dig deeper into the root cause, which lies in the human nature of tribalism that George Washington warned in his farewell address would leave governments unable to act when the people most needed them if political parties were allowed to take control. We are living the future, he predicted, right now. And he links to a YouTube video with this discussion. <laughs> Best in Luton, England, where our three-party system makes change, if anything, even less possible than in the USA. <laughs> I haven't seen this. I didn't know that there was a book either. called. Uh, oh the yeah, I have this Did in you? my reading list, yeah. and I don't know why. I thought somebody picked it as a twiv pick. Maybe we have discussed it before. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the, I'll take the last one from Kent. Hello, Doctor Racaniello, and the rest of the twiv gang. Thank you for what you do. Extremely helpful, including in this time of continuing pandemic. I have been a regular listener since the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. A question came to my mind as I took my usual walk this morning in a beautiful 61 degree F cloudless sky in Charlotte, North Carolina. Has anyone studied viruses that have adapted to life in the canopy of trees? <laughs> One of the continuing themes from the last six months of TWIV has been that we don't do enough field work. I can easily see that increased field work could be one of our most powerful ways to prepare for the next pandemic. I teach my students the drunk under the lamppost story. So as I walked this morning, looking at the fully bloomed le green leaf canopy, I was reminded that the canopy is not a well-studied bioenvironment, possibly because it is onerous to set up observations experiments high in the trees. When I think about canopy, I think of the Amazon jungle, but the question could equally apply to North American forest. I fully appreciate that virology in the canopy also means study of other life forms in the canopy. Yeah. 
in the several hundred episodes, or dare I say epitopes, to which I have listened, I've never heard anyone mention canopy. <laughs> I realize that this question from a non-biologist might sound silly, but I feel that I have to at least ask. Kent is a professor of pharmaceutical sciences. At High Point yeah. University. Cool. You know, people study uh, plant viruses for sure, and, and they mostly study them in plants that you could grow in laboratories. Some people do field work with plants as well, and trees for sure. Apple tree viruses. Uh, des pommiers. <laughs> How about that? Um, but the canopy specifically, I'm not, I just am not aware of it, but maybe someone listening. Could yeah, I'm just us. reminded of the baculoviruses that infect yes. the caterpillars that climb up to yeah. the yes. canopy and melt, and then yeah, yeah, and they spray viruses down below. Yeah, but well, you're right. There, the, the, there is there is a lot of field work. Well, I don't know about a lot, but there is field work being done in rainforest canopies where they, yeah. you know, they put on climbing gear and go up and um, set up sort of observatories and collect samples. And there are species that are certainly adapted to that, not only plants, but animals. Um, so those would be the places to look for canopy viruses. Um, I don't know of anybody doing that, but sure. Fruit bats too. They'd be up there in the canopy, right? If you go to PubMed and, and search virus canopy, you don't get anything. <laughs> Did you mean capsid? <laughs> yeah, right. You spelled mean, correct. <laughs> canapé. <laughs> canapé. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I don't. You know, I can imagine the the bits, but not the whole canopy. Oh, but if you Google viruses and canopy. canopy, you get a two year evaluation of elevated canopy trapping for Culex. <laughs> ah, uh, right. West Nile mm -hmm. virus. Huh. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, you could go after the mosquitoes, because as he says. Oh, yeah. here's another one. A, a citrus tristeza virus causing collapse of trees of sour orange. That's Svetlana's virus. Yes, oh. uh, is Svetlana detectable throughout the canopy. Yes. There you go. Hmm. Svetlana's talking at ASV, right? Uh if she is, I think it might be in a satellite. She's organizing a satellite. A satellite, She's that's right, yes. Plant virology counselor. We yeah. had her on TWIV at Maryland not mm -hmm. too long ago. Yeah. So did they use the canopy word in that paper? Referring <laughs> to, you know. Okay. So sort of. All right. Let's do some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us today? Um, we are currently at the part of the semester where I would lose absolutely anything um, <laughs> if I couldn't keep track of it. Um, and so I have been making quite a bit of use of my AirTag um, and would tell anyone that to they recommend to get one um, on my keys. I have this nice <laughs> little thing from Apple um, and I can use my phone or my watch to find my keys and my, make my keys make a noise. Now, where is your phone? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it can make, uh, make a noise. Um, I can actually, my phone can give me a map to my keys and show me how to get there. It's incredibly useful. Um, I also have learned that- Because you're driving a, directions to your car keys. It, yes. it can give me directions to, to my car keys and it's quite useful. Um, it also really helps um, entertain my friend's toddlers um, mm -hmm. to play hide and seek with the keys around the house. <laughs> Uh, so if you, like me, are having a part of your semester where you can't find your things, um, and I have actually bought these as gifts for quite a few people, um, after they've watched me use mine. So I, I highly recommend. So Brianne, I'm way ahead of you. I'm older than you. And so I've been forgetting <laughs> things for a lot longer, but, um, I've had tile for years. Yeah. It's yes. very similar. Um, yeah. I have a it's tile great. also. Yeah. I yeah. bought... I put a tile on my car keys, but my my office keys uh, is a good idea. I don't have one. I have an extra one. I think I will. Oh, I have, yeah, yeah tiles they... on every backpack, every piece of luggage <laughs> in my purse, in my wallet, in my car. Yeah, uh, they they yeah. have recommendations for things like in your car to so find it in a parking lot mm -hmm. or in your wallet or on a. They have a, a holder so that you can have it on your pet's um, <sighs> collar so that you can find your pet. It, it does seem rather useful. Yeah. And 
my I couldn't find my keys without it. <laughs> Recently, we had one of the tile batteries die, and it doesn't work if the battery is dying. <laughs> right, but they warn you. They they tell they? you they're th- yeah that they're dying, and yeah. But the app warns you that they're dying. Is that right? Well, I think you have to log in every now and then. Yeah, but yeah. All right. Yeah, Kathy, what do you have for us? I have a dental art sculpture slash mobile slash chandelier. So uh, this was featured in the UM News uh, one day last week. And then uh, my seminar guest last week was uh, Lisa Gerlinski for our Heritage Seminar, former trainee. And I said, oh, Lisa, there's this new art in the dental school. Let's see if we can get in. It was after five. The building was locked, but there was somebody sitting near the door and they let us in. And we wound our way around uh, to find this sculpture, which is just fabulous. The photographer for this particular article that I picked is really great because the pictures that I could take of it on my phone are just, they just don't do it justice. But it's this thing, a sculpture, gold plated, hanging from the ceiling in an atrium. And the dental tools were donated by uh, faculty in the dental school. The uh, art is based on uh, a Columbine that uh, one of the former faculty members, uh, uh, he's since passed away, but his his thing was x-rays and he did x-rays of flowers for his hobby. And so it's a two-dimensional flower uh, uh, x-ray that came from a three-dimensional flower and is now made three-dimensional in this beautiful sculpture that's all gold-plated. There's bicones, there's dental forceps, there's dental mirrors, and uh, it's just It's just stunning. It's really great. So uh, check out the photos in this article. And if you're ever in Ann Arbor, I'll help you get in to see it in in the dental school. This sounded familiar, the concept of it. And I I have gone to the artist's site and I just realized I saw another of his um, in the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. Mm -hmm. Um, And so his his style... uh, yeah, I really recommend checking out his site as well. He he does these very complex three-dimensional sculptures where every piece is suspended on strings is the mm-hmm. the idea and this dental school thing looks awesome too. Yeah. The one in the, in the one in SeaTac is a uh is a bird. It's like a goose mm. um in flight coming down and landing. Um and it's this huge thing that kind of moves a little bit in the air drafts. It's very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I did not realize that it was dental tools at all. Yeah. And I was kind of waiting for the how is this related mm. to dentistry right. part. <laughs> um, and now that I know, it's much cooler. Yes. Because yes. it's beautiful. Yeah. But I couldn't figure out why dentistry. Well, and the yeah. choice of the Columbine was significant for the um, right. uh, someone at the dental school who had done x rays of Columbines. Mm-hmm. Neat. Very cool. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I have a place that's just down the road from me, but I really recommend um, if you're anywhere in the vicinity of Hartford, Connecticut, um, you should you should definitely pop by here. Or if you're traveling and you're in Hartford and wondering, gee, what is there to do in Hartford? Um, pop on up to the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut, which is in um, mm-hmm. in Windsor, Connecticut, and yeah, I'm a radio geek, so this is this is definitely my bag, baby. But um, it's I think anybody is going to have a good time here. Um, it's a little museum. Um, the the founder of it is often there. He's very recognizable because he's about six and a half feet tall. Um, but uh, he'll if if he's there, he'll often uh, if traffic is slow. He'll give a, a tour, um, <laughs> and it's radios and telephones and movie making equipment and lots of uh lots of neat memorabilia they also have a a vintage computing section um they have a a radio studio on site it doesn't record any radio shows on a regular basis but i think you can actually rent it if you want to record something and in that they have some exhibits that are actual artifacts from the golden age of radio so like a, 
uh, like Foley effects, a couple of coconut shells for horse hooves. And um, they have the original bells from NBC Radio, the local oh, affiliate. Cool. The boom, boom, boom. That was actually just three little bells from, you know, in a mallet. And so you can go in and you can do the <laughs> station ID sound. Um, they have a, a restored Wurlitzer jukebox that's it's from 1940. And it's just this glorious art deco piece. <laughs> been fully restored to its original functioning um, and you can push the buttons and have it play one of these old wax records from the, the time period. Um, just really, really nifty. Plan to spend uh, an hour or so at least walking around this place and interacting with exhibits. You could dial a rotary phone and see how it, um, how the circuits trip and then it, they've got it connected to an original relay station from 9x that will you know relay just a good time they have swap meets every they do so often. i was have just I, the, what made me think of this and put it into my queue for picks was i was just at one recently cool. um went down there they had a big swap meet neat that looks cool yeah, yeah. It looks, sounds like a good thing to do in hartford it is very cool the radio radios museums are cool yeah um, my pick is a book I just discovered. I didn't realize it um, existed. It's uh, For the Love of Enzymes by Arthur Kornberg. It was published in 1991. And I just learned of it. And it's The Odyssey of a Biochemist. Of course, Arthur Kornberg famously worked on DNA synthesis and got the Nobel Prize in 1959. And this is a really well-written book. It's, you know, from his perspective, it's a personal story of DNA synthesis. And he's got experiments in there. I was just looking at one. He's got a a nice set of graphs that explain DNA repair, you know, how you can study it. And it's really good. Um, so uh, I highly recommend it. It's pretty straightforward. You can understand it. it and I like on the back, you know, they're the... The quotes, um, it's basically a history in his perspective. The um, Who said this? Here, Maxine Clark from New Scientist wrote, Kornberg's book shines with a love of science. Let us hope that there are those like him today who will, in 50 years' time, be able to inform, instruct, and amaze us with a book such as this. That's cool. I mean, you know, many many of us try to do that. So I highly recommend it. Um and you can, uh, it, it's good. It's got illustration. Here, here's the DNA repair. Here's the two graphs showing what happens when you have uh, uh, the wrong nucleotide in. It gets excised really quickly because he worked on the, the excision activity of, uh, of DNA synthesis as well. So um, check it out if you want to read about that from a personal viewpoint, which I really like. It's well written too. It's pretty clear. Now, and there's also a Wikipedia page for him, which I was looking at today. He he was born in 1918 in New York City and died in 2007. He, he ended up his career at uh, Stanford. I met him once. Uh, it, he was quite old then, and I was doing some consulting for, I think it was Amgen. We We had a meeting, and he came to Amgen from Stanford, and he used two uh, ski poles to walk with because he couldn't walk so well. A lot of people do that. At the retrovirus meeting, I was just at Peter Vogt, famous retrovirologist. He's 94. And he had two ski poles <laughs> as well. I think it's a, it's a hoot when people still get around like that, right? It's really good. Uh, anyway, so I'm looking at his Wikipedia page. And I don't know, this is just strange observation. He was married three times and each time his wife died. So his first wife, she died. His second wife, she died. And then his third wife, she died. So I'm so sorry that he lost three wives or and vice versa, but that's I've never seen that before. Anyway, uh, I like that. I like the title, the uh, For the Love of Enzymes. He obviously loved them, just like we love viruses. Not Very because cool. we're not because we're morbid or anything, but we just love them. It's pretty cool. Okay, that is Twiv eight ninety four. 
You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us a question or a comment to TWIV at microbe.tv or a pick. And if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially. We depend on your contributions. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And there you will find multiple ways to contribute. I actually got a check yesterday in the mail here at the incubator. The, the mail is working. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> A paper check. It's just some people want to write checks and mail them. You can find the the address there on the on the web page if you'd like. And um, we are a five hundred one c three, so your contributions are U.S. federal tax deductible. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He is Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. And now we're all owned by uh, Elon Musk, right? Yeah, I don't know how much longer I'll be Alan Dove on Twitter. We'll see. <laughs> Do you think that's a bad thing? Uh, I mean, I guess one toxic tech bro bought the company from the toxic tech bros who owned it before, <laughs> yes, <indeed>. and I, <laughs> maybe it's worse. I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's good for. Well, it's going to go private, right? So. It's not. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I've pulled away from the platform recently anyway. I, I only post occasionally and rarely yeah. check in at all. I, I actually post most of the time from the command line, so I don't even see. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, funny. <laughs> I don't even see the stream, really. Cool. Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>